Hello and welcome to episode two of the Unanimity Podcast, where thoughts matter for July 20th, 2024. I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute. Well, this episode drops on another personal anniversary of mine, more than a couple of decades old. Nothing in this world is typically perfect, including memories, especially my memory, but long-lasting fond thoughts and memories are like a gift that keeps on giving. In episode one, the topic was the minimum wage. What might seem like an extremely isolated or narrow policy is actually just an example of all types of government intervention in the economy. In this episode two, the topic is economic inequality. When I ask people, they universally agree that equality is good and inequality is bad, but no one seems to know what that means, especially in terms that most of us can agree on. In recent memory, the topic usually surfaces in the media or social media as a matter of a static comparison of the distribution of income in a particular place at a particular time, and of course, They all are portrayed as a bad thing, especially since 2014. Here we begin not with a snapshot, but with a big historical picture, tracing the issue from animal man to early social man, prehistoric and historic man, and modern man. This big picture clearly shows that economic inequality is a good thing, and that it goes hand in hand with economic progress for all. Of course, demonstrating that this is not just some arbitrary statistical correlation or capitalist trick, and that it is actually impossible to make us all equal, might take additional episodes. But at least we will have a very large set of facts and experience to start with. In contrast to what we have all been told to believe in the media, that we should all be the same, equal, these facts support the contention that we are all different and that we are, in fact, really like the results of economic inequality. In my general introduction to this podcast on April 20th, I noted the following, quote, the massive disagreement in society inevitably has a political core and politics by its very nature is divisive, end quote. So here I ask you to check your politics at the door, but not your intuition, common sense, or core values. I do not know if envy is a feature of modern political ideology or something deep in our primitive DNA, but I doubt that it is enlightening or a good basis for public policy. Right now, people come to this issue not in the spirit of two people who come to a debate forum to better inform themselves, but rather more like two prize fighters, only interested in jabbing their opponents and looking for a knockout punch. This episode is an historical perspective on economic inequality from the earliest times to the present. Obviously, we want to review some facts. However, It is a stylized history that necessarily glosses over unique individual cases and differentiation. So, for example, at a certain time, there must have been unique, relative, advanced civilizations amongst the primitive. And there are still relatively primitive groups living in the current era. I also want to caution you that history is more speculative the further back in time we go and that my presentation is very general and subject to revision based on new facts. However, I can say with some confidence that it is based on the current understanding and consensus of the experts on the long history under examination here. Since Thomas Piketty published his famous book, Capital in the 21st Century, in 2014, and his several subsequent books, a consensus has emerged that inequality has been increasing substantially throughout the last many decades in nations where statistics can be constructed. I would note that many of Piketty's statistical constructions have drawn damning criticisms by experts in his own field, 
many of whom share his own normative, ethical, egalitarian point of view. And of course, Karl Marx predicted this increased economic inequality, and he attributed it to capitalist exploitation of labor, a hypothesis that is no longer considered scientifically viable. Eventually, we want to challenge the Piketty consensus on all fronts, but this episode firmly establishes that economic inequality has indeed increased over the very long run, and especially so in recent decades. A very long time ago, at the dawn of humanity, people were very equal in many respects. A person did not rise much or fall much relative to all the others over their lifetime. Their position changed little, if at all, relative to their peers. Although the fate of an individual group might rise and expand or plummet and disappear dramatically in the short run, even economic outcomes were incredibly equal. Every individual was able to obtain a roughly equal share of their community's output relative to their role and needs. Indeed, for virtually all human existence, this arrangement could be called, quote, the human condition, unquote. The human population was very small, estimated to be less than one person for every thousand people alive today. There was no pollution or human-built structures. The economic condition for these humans was usually extreme poverty. There was no clothing or shelter in the modern sense, and people were exposed to the elements throughout their relatively short lives. The mostly meat diet was very nutritious and eaten raw. However, food sources were undependable. There was no means of food preservation or storage. Many people died of diarrhea or food poisoning. Food availability was also variable due to seasonality and animal migration. Hunger was normal. The individual human unit was the migratory clan, like most other large mammal animals at the time. While famine was a constant threat, Many human groups also had periods of feasting conditions. War between groups was also common. Their bounty consisted largely of killing relatively defenseless mammals of their own size or larger. They were efficient killers and very efficient eaters, consuming the brain and other organs, connective tissues, and bones. The clan unit moved with migrations, driving many species extinct. When humans migrated to North and South America, they quickly drove 80% of mammals extinct. The earlier migration to Australia killed off all but two species of mammals. The earliest population estimates of humans was only in the tens of thousands, when at the beginning of social man, it was only a few million. Thousands of years later, at the time of the Greeks, world population was only roughly 200 million, or 180 acres of land per person, or more than a square mile of land for a family of four. Even 2,000 years later than that, on the verge of the Industrial Revolution, population was only three or four times larger than that figure. Infant mortality was roughly 25 percent, and child mortality was roughly 50% throughout history until it began to plummet during the Industrial Revolution. Today, child mortality is less than 5% and only a small fraction of 1% in the advanced economies. Life expectancy from prehistoric times to only about 200 years ago stayed in the range from the high 20s to the low 30s age average. Although the world population has increased by a factor of 100,000 times over this period, life expectancy began to increase rapidly in places where the Industrial Revolution had taken root. 
all through the earliest times, humans were highly equal in an economic sense and otherwise. Only with the beginning of social man thousands of years ago did obvious levels of economic inequality emerge. People living in settlements engaged in agriculture, animal husbandry, and trade were clearly better off than those who continued in the hunter-gatherer mode people were naturally attracted to such settlements. Within the settlements, there were also higher levels of inequality as those who developed valuable skills or who were proficient makers of things or traders were relatively better off compared to unskilled labor. Despite the emergence of economic inequality, the standards of living obviously increased significantly And more importantly, the recipes, or what we might call today technologies, increasing everyone's economic status, were coming into existence for the first time. It seems to me that history emerges as some of these advanced societies became political, militaristic, and conquest-oriented. Although now adept already at language, numbers, letters, symbols, alphabets, etc., these class-led or politicized societies, usually some god-military dynastic hybrids, naturally mark their victories, not just with celebrations, but with memorials to themselves that were meant to last. As we have found or recovered this evidence, it has become the markers of our early history. So history emerges a few thousand years ago, backdated with the help of archaeologists a few thousand more years ago, as a history of conquest of militarily led and politicized societies rose and spread only to recede and be extinguished. To generalize, these societies were much more unequal and narrow at the top compared with those that emerged with social man. This was the advent of taxation or wealth extraction from producers. Although these societies were still typically more advanced because of the building up of technologies, capital, and trading arrangements over time. For example, the engineers of the Roman Empire built on the technological foundations laid by the Egyptians, the Greeks, and earlier civilizations. These societies were still largely farmers and slave-based labor economies dominated by small religious and military classes. Population and standards of living increased throughout, as far as we know, through historical reconstruction. So, in relatively recent times, economic equality diminished even further, and economic inequality increased somewhat with these large class-based societies, with their teeny leadership class populations skewing the upper end and slavery and serfdom blocking off the lower end, until, of course, they gave way just a couple of hundreds of years ago. As we march through time, from hunter-gatherer man to early social man to prehistoric man, early historic man, there seems to be a clear set of trends. The economic status of humanity as a whole has dramatically improved. It has developed various technologies, like how to grow crops, tools, the ability to communicate and record events, and especially and fundamentally to facilitate trade. For example, the wheel is considered the most important invention in human history, precisely because it is associated with trade. But the wheel also helps with production and productivity. Now, economists might argue that property rights or language were more important economically or more fundamentally But as such, they were also too intangible in the case of property rights or too social in the case of language to receive such an important historical designation. 
it would be like claiming the balloon corps or the quartermaster general department won or lost the battle of gettysburg the most important human development is the advent of the use of money seemingly insignificant and ephemeral as well as the source of all evil money is denigrated and overlooked in history and archaeology except to date discoveries with coins, money is so important that its emergence and relevance will be topics of separate future episodes of this podcast. More recent times, in terms of the last several hundred years, have seen a massive increase in economic inequality in the West. The uber-wealthy come and go with the generations, but the upper strata as a group continues to soar higher. This has occurred during the transition away from slavery, serfdom, and class-based societies to a more free and classless world population over the last couple of hundred years. What is also crystal clear is that along with this great increase in economic inequality, there has been an unprecedented increase in the standard of living. Yes, The upper end of the economic status has increased enormously, but standards of living are a reflection more of the status of the lower end of economic status groups. What do most people in society have ready access to in terms of goods, services, and social amenities? The lowest economic status group of the working population in the most unequal economy, the United States, lives in a modern structure with a great deal of living space, along with all the modern conveniences and appliances and the typical access to transportation, communications, and other services. Their standard of living dwarfs that of royalty from just a few hundred years ago along with their highly advanced life expectancy and other economically dependent social statistics. Before we transition away from this distilled ancient history, I would like to take us through two concrete examples where much greater equality occurred. I think this is an important lesson here for me, of what is involved with inequality and achieving more equality. The first major surge towards economic equality, we need to remember, is the Black Death Plague during the Middle Ages, where one-third to one-half of the European area population was killed off from disease and starvation. The result was a dramatic increase inequality in economic terms. The reason being is that while the amount of labor plummeted, the amount of capital and cleared farmland was about the same. Each worker was naturally more productive, and the tight labor market forced up wages, which capitalists of those days had to pay or do without labor. So amongst the death and despair of the Black Death, the European population experienced a big, noticeable increase in economic equality. The second dramatic surge in economic equality that was noticeable and noticeably more pleasant than the Black Death occurred after World War II, especially in the United States, where well-measured income equality significantly increased the gap between workers and capitalists shrank. At first, this was thought to have been the result of the New Deal policies helping the poor and high income tax rates sticking it to the rich. However, those government programs were not very effective or targeted in helping the poor or sticking it to the rich and were not dominating factors. While these and many other factors did play a role, Most of the empirical studies do not consider some of the dominant causal factors. Noteworthy among the missing causal factors are that consecutive generations suffered from population losses, 
especially young adult males, and also a lack of family formation during World War I, 1914 through 1918, the Spanish flu, 1918 to 1920, the Great Depression, 1930 to 1939, and World War II, 1939 to 1945, with each event killing many millions on a global scale. The combined effect no doubt caused a huge gap in the labor market worldwide. Meanwhile, in post-World War II America, the United States owned most of the world's capital stock, not destroyed in the war, and had experienced a sustained shrinkage in the prime male worker population. The result was a surge in real income for the working class in the U.S. and a noticeable decrease in economic inequality. The two noteworthy surges in economic equality, the Black Death and especially post-World War II America, are often used as examples of the possibility of establishing economic equality. But make no mistake about it, both periods were only possible because of widespread death and destruction and are no model for public policy. In fact, historian Walter Schleidel concluded that mass violence and other catastrophes were, quote, the great leveler, unquote, of economic inequality throughout history. As the post-World War II effects waned, the U.S. and elsewhere began to experience increasing economic inequality again. Measures of economic inequality in terms of both income and wealth have surged globally. In fact, it is difficult to measure and to put into perspective the extent of increased inequality with all previous periods. The surge of global standards of living is also remarkable. Global life expectancy has easily doubled over the last century, and world population has increased by over 300%. Life expectancy and population are two prime indicators of well-distributed economic performance. Well more than a billion people have been able to lift themselves out of extreme poverty. The prevalence of running water, effective sewer treatment, electricity, communications, and high-speed transportation has gone from virtually non-existent to nearly ubiquitous. Human and horsepower have been largely displaced. The use of computers and internet communications have been transformative in just the last few decades, even in the poorest populations, and have coincided with rising economic inequality. In conclusion, over the known history of man, increasing economic inequality is associated with rising standards of living for all. Using common analogies, increased economic inequality lifts all boats and not only increases the size of the economic pie, but also cuts everyone larger pieces of pie. Now, if you, like me, were infected with the prevailing ideology, then this stark presentation will be difficult to mentally digest. That prevailing ideology is kind of a hodgepodge of conservatism, which is against change, Marxism and anti-capitalism, and all the various socialist ideologies, such as fascism, national socialism or Nazism, and American progressivism, all, of course, expressed in their idealistic states. In economics, the basic error is found in the labor theory of value, which dominated high thinking from the ancient Greek philosophers through Adam Smith and the classical economist. Here, all value is created solely by the hands of labor, and everything else is regarded as theft. 
In modern times, we now understand that capitalists, entrepreneurs, and resource owners all provide an essential and valuable service and play an indispensable role in the economy. But the air still infects our thinking via the conditioning of the prevailing ideology. The error is also found more fundamentally in zero-sum thinking. That is, if someone is benefiting from an exchange, someone else must be losing from that exchange. While this type of thinking can be appealing concerning exchanges that we are unfamiliar with, that is told to us in conspiratorial terminology, it is totally foreign to our understanding of our own informed personal experiences. For example, many of us have succumbed to the notion that certain businesses have recently raised their prices and are taking advantage of their consumers. However, when we are informed that prices are going up all across the economy and that businesses that we deal with are also paying more for their products and inputs, labor, utilities, etc., and that the government's bank the Federal Reserve has printed trillions of dollars out of thin air into the economy, we quickly realize that it's probably not our local businesses that are taking advantage of us. With these disclaimers now aside, future episodes will examine, one, the natural inequality of man and why we love it. Two, there are some nefarious ways that artificially induce economic income, and wealth inequality, and I'll go into the things we can do about it. And three, I want to present a detailed breakdown of the myth of American inequality from the great society of the mid-1960s to the present to show the folly of economic policy regarding income distribution. Thanks for listening to the Unanimity Podcast, where thoughts matter. I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute.